Hello, everybody, and welcome to my March live stream. My name is Andy Ward. This is my this is my channel, Ancient Pottery, where we talk about how to make pottery the way it was a long time ago. So if you're looking to learn about making primitive or replica pottery, this is a great place for you. Today's, uh, today's live stream or this month's live stream is going to be focused on 10 of the most common mistakes, especially those mistakes that new people make when they're first getting into primitive pottery, those things that cause pots to break or uh, you know, not be so, not turn out so good, mostly breakage. Uh, and so we'll talk about those 10 things, but then we'll also talk about what you can do to avoid those 10 things, things you can do to, you know, make your pottery better and avoid these mistakes. Okay. Uh, I'm also answering, importantly, I'm answering your questions. So if you have any, excuse me, if you have any pottery related questions, just drop them in the chat. I'll try to get them all answered in the course of this live stream. Uh, the other thing that I'm doing uh, today, special for March live stream, is I have a giveaway. So this is a pottery kit. This is a complete pottery kit. It's a basket. It's got a water bowl, a pookie, gourd scraper, needle tool, polishing stone. I've got a piece of white clay, a piece of buckskin, and a um, oh a deer rib bone and a, a, a yuck of leaf paintbrush and a lump of clay. So uh, it's an entire kit, and I'll be giving that away in the course of this live stream. Um, in order to be eligible, you're going to have to hang around and wait. There's going to be a certain uh, piece of text. There's going to be a, um, what they call it, a hashtag that you put in the chat. And then uh, it'll automatically select at random one of you that have entered that, that um, I can't say it, hashtag, one of you that entered that hashtag in the chat. So um, that'll be later on. Okay. Is my audio good? My shirt. I understand there's been lots of rain in your area. It does this help identify areas for good clay? Yeah, lots of rain does help you find clay, but also lots of rain makes it hard for me to get out and fire. So right now I'm a little frustrated because uh, I want to get out and enjoy the spring weather and fire pottery. And I've been sitting around the house waiting for it to dry up. So, um, you know, we can, I live in a desert. We can always use the rain, but at the same time, uh, it does get frustrating when it won't let up. Uh, just to cover the a couple of things here, um, the giveaway is only for people that have a U.S. mailing address. So um, if you are in a different country, I'm sorry, but I can only mail this within the United States. It's very expensive to mail things overseas. Uh, I have a workshop, a pottery workshop coming up. That's going to be March 29th through April 2nd. That's a five-day intensive pottery workshop where we do everything from collecting clay, building the pots. Uh, we'll visit museums. Uh, we'll we'll go to mines and collect uh, ore for pigments. Um and then we'll fire the pots on the last day in a big open bonfire. So uh, that's a really great experience. I've had three people drop out in the last couple of weeks. So um, no, no, I've had four people drop out. Uh, I have I have openings in that class. So if you are interested in that workshop, I know it's it's short. You know, it's short time because it's coming right up in a couple of weeks. But if you are interested and you're available, uh, that's on my website. Uh, where's my website? Hold on. I'm using StreamYard today, which is a different uh, software that I'm used to using. Um, so anyways, that, right there, the address for my website. And if you go there and click on classes, you'll see that class if you're interested in it. Um, and then uh, I have a Potter's Gathering. So the, my second annual uh, Southwest Potter's Gathering is taking place April 5th through the 7th. So that's a three-day event. And what we're going to do is the first day on Friday, we're going to go look at some ruins and then we're going to look at some museum collections of ancient pottery. So we're going to we're going to uh, look at pottery sherds and and whole pots on Friday. And gonna, each one of these days is going to require driving. So we're going to drive to different locations. Uh, and the second day is clay. So Saturday we're going to drive around this big loop around Southeast Arizona and collect clay from multiple locations. And I talk about you know what to look for and what kind of qualities we're looking for in the clay. So it's a great opportunity. Uh, Sunday is about minerals. So Sunday, we're going to drive to some old mines and we're going to walk around and collect pigment minerals, uh, reds and blacks, iron oxide and manganese prim primarily. And so uh, it's a great opportunity for anybody that's wanting to collect some materials or learn more about ancient pottery and that sort of thing. And you can kind of <clears throat> go to just the days you're interested in. Let's say I'm only interested in the ancient uh, ruins or I'm only interested in the pigment minerals. Feel free to come to whichever one you want. Um, but it is only open, this event is only open to people that are supporters of the channel. So if you're a channel member or if you're a, uh, an Ancient Potters Club member or a patron, those are the people that are uh, able to come to this event. So if you want to come, uh, you know, you can you can buy a YouTube channel member, click in the join button right here in the YouTube window for a couple bucks a month. So 
uh, if you want to do that. And that's open to anybody who's a supporter of the channel. I do ask you to RSVP me uh, that you're coming so I know who's coming. Okay. Uh, and also hit the like button. That'll help me in the YouTube algorithm. I uh, go back to the chat real quick. Um, Chris in Kansas is actually in Kansas. Imagine that. <laughs> uh, do you think that Fraser build raises method for enhancing class? I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. Sorry. Uh, rule and SFO video, not visible, nor is sound, even though streaming is active. Um, start it. Huh? Weird. I don't know. I would love to live closer. Sounds amazing. Hi, blank screen. No poly visible. Bill, I will get out and return. Oh, that's Teresa again. I'm sorry, Teresa. I don't know what the problem is. Okay, let's talk about those 10, uh, those 10 problems that potters have. And I tried to order them in, you know, the order that I think from least important to most important, but it really varies so much based on where you live and what materials you're using and stuff that it's kind of hard to say. I mean, number 10 might be the most valuable piece of information for you, but it wasn't for me. Uh, getting too attached to one bad clay. I'll, I, this happens over and over again. I've seen so many people, especially when they're first getting into this, they find some clay or they want to use the clay that's where they live or it's at their grandmother's farm or, you know, uh, they, they get emotionally attached to a specific clay body that they found. And that's great, but you got to remember that clay's all over the world, right? There's there's thousands of different clays just within a couple miles radius of where I'm standing, right? And only a percentage of those, maybe 10 or 20% are actually usable for making pottery. And maybe maybe even a smaller percent, maybe only 5% is really actually good, you know, really good for making pottery. So a lot of times if you get attached to that first clay you find, it's not going to be that good. You have an open mind about clay and, and don't get attached to one because, uh, a lot. I mean, I get so many questions through emails, through Facebook Messenger, through uh, Instagram, through YouTube comments. Um, I found, you know, I'm trying to get started in this, but my clay is doing this or doing this. And and really, the most common advice I give is maybe you should try a different clay because the clay you're using doesn't sound all that great. I mean, there's things you can do to improve clay, but usually they're pretty marginal. So um, if you find a clay and it's working. But then you thought, well, it's not that great. I mean, look around, see what else is out there. You know, you don't have to be married to a clay body. Um, and the next one, number nine uh, on my list is uh, using temper or clay with bad minerals. So I've got some good examples to show you here. Um, there are certain minerals that you don't want to have in your clay body because they're going to cause problems in your pottery. So the first one I'm going to talk about is calcium. Some of you may be uh, familiar with this. So uh, calcium carbonate comes in all different forms, like limestone is calcium carbonate, but so is caliche, which is a very different mineral if you see it in nature. Um, and so there's different things that are calcium carbonate, but they all have the same effect. Uh, over about 820 degrees Celsius, uh, that calcium carbonate turns to calcium oxide. And then when it gets damp, after, this is after it's been made into a pot, if it gets damp, then it um, it absorbs moisture and it, let's see, calcium oxide turns to, no, calcium I don't remember that. I'm not a chemist. Anyways, it expands. It produces heat and it expands at that point and it causes pops in your pottery. And depending on how much you have in your pottery, it can completely destroy the pot or it can just make a few little unsightly blemishes. So let me show you. I'll start with an example of one that's literally being destroyed. So this is a little pot that my wife actually made some years back. And it is just, see all the little white spots? And, and the clay is actually kind of peeling up on it. There's, there's chunks coming off, little chunks, because it's, it's just impregnated with calcium. And it's all just kind of expanding. And it's not like I've dunked this in water to get it wet. It's just absorbing moisture out of the atmosphere. And it's, it's just going to eventually just completely fall apart. There's, It's a mess. Now, here's one. You might have seen me make this pot last year. And I was trying to make some brown clay. And so I used some clay I wasn't used to using. And if you see, you see the little white freckles all over it. And, and a lot of places where there is one of those freckles, there's a little divot right there. It's a little dent because the, the piece of calcium was under the surface. And as it expanded, it blew off a chunk of clay on the outside. So that's what you get um, with calcium carbonate. And that's just one. That's probably the most common 
the most problematic mineral, but there's other minerals you want to avoid too. So this is a pot uh, that I fired in my last video. So um, now with calcium carbonate, it, it'll come up later. So you'll fire the pot and it might be months down the road when it starts falling. So this is really problematic because sometimes a potter will make a pot. It seems fine. They sell the pot, they take money for it. And then, you know, maybe within the first year, it starts getting a few of these. Maybe after a couple of years, the pot's exploding with them. Um, you know, and then, you know, if, if the person wants to take it back, the potter has to basically refund the money. I mean, it's it really problematic because it's late. But some of these happen right away. And so this, this pot came out pretty good, but uh, it had a little bit of... Um, uh, what's it called? Um, pyrite, iron pyrite in the temper material. So the mountains around me have a fair amount of pyrite in them. And so if you collect sand from certain washes, it'll have pyrite. You won't even notice it because it's not super common. It's, you know, it's very, very scarce, but it doesn't take much and you get these pops. So I'm going to try to show you this. You see that? Okay. You see that hole right there in the black painted area is a dent. And if you look in the bottom of the dent, as a little shiny bit because pyrite is shine is fool's gold is what it is. So it's a little dent and that's, it's pyrite where it's popped. Basically, I think it gives off sulfur at a certain temperature and causes those pops. And that's not the only one. That's the largest one that's in a painted area, but there's a few all over the pot. So there's that too. And there's, there's other things you don't want to get in your, in your temper and your clay body. So that's a mistake that new people make, but I mean, it's a mistake I'm still making because a lot of times, like I'll collect sand out of a wash that I've never been to before. And I look at it closely and I'm like, well, it doesn't look like it has limestone or it doesn't look like it has pyrite, but it doesn't take much to cause problems. So um, that's a, that's a common mistake. Uh, let me go back to the chat real quick, see if I'm caught up on things. Sharing all your knowledge. Thank you. I appreciate you all being here and asking questions. Feel free to ask your questions if you have them in the chat. I'm trying to get to them all. Uh, I was attached to my clay, says Brandoom, and it wasn't the best until I found some more. It's a different, at a different job site. That's vastly superior to my initial clay. I've been cutting the superior clay with other stuff. And that's good too. Yeah, mixing clays is another way to get a better clay sometimes. I mean, you might have two marginal clays and be able to mix them and have a really good clay. One time I accidentally added calcium temper to clay. Oops. Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, and it happens. It happens. Can you use volcanic ash? Yeah, volcanic ash makes a great temper, and it's rel relatively inert in the firing, so it doesn't produce any pops or spalls or any of the problems that I'm ever aware of. I have pyrite, fool's gold, bad to have in temper. Yes, it's not desirable in temper. What happened to an auger bowl you made for me? Auger bowl. My wife says, what happened to my auger bowl? But I don't think she meant auger. I wonder what that was supposed to me. Similar to having plaster bits left during slip test. Yeah, that's another way that you can get calcium in your clay. A lot of times people use plaster of Paris like bats or like pookies. It's common uh, a lot of places to make pookies out of plaster of Paris because it's, it's um, you know, it's porous. It's absorbent. Makes a good pookie. But if you get a little chip of plaster in your clay, that's calcium carbonate. You have the same problem. And gypsum is another mineral I try to avoid. Yeah, gypsum's bad too. Um, well, yeah, no, actually the, the plaster Paris is gypsum, isn't it? So it's not exactly the same, but it's similar. I see what you're saying. Quartz sand is a good, quartz, is quartz sand a good temper source because of the silica-like prop? Yeah, quartz works fine. A lot of the uh, Native Americans' prehistoric pottery was tempered with quartz sand. Hi, uh, from Chihuahua, Mexico. Hey, look at that. Uh, how you doing, Oscar? Uh, oh, our well has hard water. It makes sense that the clay would have calcium. Um, yeah, well, the, the calcium that's in the water is not the same. It's not going to cause the same problem because if the calcium is dissolved in your water, like our water here in Tucson is very hard, but that doesn't cause those spalls that I'm talking about. You actually have to have a chunk of it, uh, not, not a dissolved, uh, amount in the water. You have to have a solid chunk. And so, uh, although, Hard water can cause those solid chunks to build up in, say, your hot water heater or your tea kettle. Uh, it won't cause that in your clay. Oh, oh, the sugar bowl. Um, I get, yeah, well, our well has hard, yeah. All my pots have issues with spalling. Still can't figure out if it's the clay, the temper, or the firing. 
Um, well, if it's either the clay or the temper, I would say not me. So you can start. Um, I don't know why that one got selected. Let me unselect it. I don't know why that um, it, you can start doing some tests with that. Like, for example, if you want to know if the problem is your clay, go out, you know, go buy some silica sand at the hardware store. Temper with that. Are you still getting the spalls? Then it's your clay, right? Go buy some commercial clay. Add some uh, your regular sand you've been using. Do you, are you getting spalls? Then the problem is the temper. So you're just going to run some have to run some experiments to find out what it is. My pots start to crack when I'm making larger ones. <clears throat> uh, sugar bowl, fat finger syndrome. I had my first spalls on my last firing, which was also my hottest. Maybe that was the first time I got to 800C. Yeah, it's possible that you were firing below that before. <clears throat> that happens. That happens. You know, you, you're used to firing. You're getting like 750s. 750 will make a nice pot, you know. You'll get a decent pot at 750. You won't notice you have that problem. You get a little bit hotter. Boom. It just shows up out of nowhere. That's not uncommon, Martha. <clears throat> I put a cloth over the plaster of Paris to prevent contamination of the clay. That's a good idea. Some spalling could be lint or hair. Well, my pottery is all pretty much tempered with dog hair. So <laughs> I haven't had any problems with hair. The hair usually just burns away. Uh, can you use sawdust as a temper? Um, yeah. So <clears throat> you can use um, organic tempers, uh, sawdust, um, manure, um, and, and they will do the same thing as temper, but they will burn away in the firing. So that leaves a very porous pot. So if you're looking for porosity, let's say if you're making um, a, a water cooler or um if you're trying to, there's like air conditioner things they have in India where they make like clay tubes. I'm not sure exa exactly how that works. Um, then, you know, you would temper with organic temper on purpose. But for a lot of things, like if you were just making, you know, something to drink out of or something, you know, you wouldn't want that porosity. But in some cases, it is desirable. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, organic temper is a thing. Okay, let's go on to the next, uh, the next problem then. Using temper or clay with bad minerals. Working clay too wet. So I find that a lot of students of mine, especially people who take my workshop, if they have a background in wheel thrown pottery, um, <clears throat> they will tend to want to work their clay way wetter than it needs to be. So it's really just a matter of getting a feel for where, you know, the right dryness, dampness that you need in order to hand build, to coil pottery. And it is different if you're throwing than if you're hand building. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Clay that's too wet doesn't have a lot of strength. It's lacking in wet strength. And so your pottery is more likely to slump. Uh, and so having it at the right uh, dryness and wetness will make a big difference on what you're able to build. Uh, and so a wet wet can be a problem. And so that's just something you have to learn as you, as you get started. That's something that happens frequently to people that are just starting. Uh, maybe after a few hours of hand building, you'll start getting the handle where you want it, you know, how dry, how damp. Uh, but this is a common thing that I see, especially in my workshops. Like I say, people come, they've never done much hand building or they, you know, they're used to throwing on the wheel. They, they work clay a lot damper on the wheel than what I need. Okay, let's go on to the next one then. Not bonding coils good. And this is one that plagued me for years when I first started. Uh, uh, when you're adding coils, to your clay, you're building up the coils. If you don't get that coil bonded to the body of the pot well, and it might look just fine, but as as it as it dries, it may crack right along that coil line, or it could be you're not even going to see that crack develop until the firing. Um, but <clears throat> those, you know, that coil line will come back to haunt you later on. I this used to happen to me all the time when I was first starting, and I see it in my students in workshops as well. So you've got to make sure you've got that coil bonded. And, you know, uh, some people do the, the slip and score. So they, they actually score the coil, paint a little slip in between it, and that pretty much glues it in place. So you know, if you're having trouble getting that bonding pinch or something, getting it attached, uh, you could always do that as a way to make sure that it's connected good. But um, it is a common problem. And like I said, I had that problem for years when I was first starting out. Um. Where are we at here? Let me check the chat real quick. Uh, any advice to fire better? How long should my pot dry before firing and how to prevent the pot from heating up too quickly? Um, 
your pot, it depends how long, I can't tell you how long to let it dry because it depends a lot on the humidity where you live, right? Like here in Tucson, my pots can dry out really fast, like in a day. Uh, you know, but people in Florida, it might take weeks. So it's going to vary a lot based on how dry it is. But definitely make sure it's fully dry. And you can you warm it gently in your oven if you want to make sure that it's fully dry. And then um, how to prevent pot from heating up too quickly. Uh, and that's something I'm going to talk about here today before I'm done. But um, heating up too quickly. So when you start your fire, you want to... You know, when you're when you're firing, if you're firing outdoors on the surface like I do, then you're going to if you use cover sherds, if you use a lot of cover sherds around the pot or like a big sagger over it, then that's going to block all that radiant heat. And that's going to help it warm up a lot more slowly. Uh, the other thing that you can do is if you build that fire, let's say you've got like a teepee fire around the pot. If you start the fire on top, then that fire is going to slowly burn down and it's gonna heat up more slowly. If you start the fire on the bottom, then it's gonna heat up very quickly as that fire shoots to the top. So those are two ways that you can make sure it heats up more slowly. Uh, Ching, I'm trying to read your name, I'm sorry. Ching, Chinga Chiguk uh, gifted me a five, uh, gifted five Andy Ward Ancient Pottery memberships. Oh, that's awful nice of you. So he gave five memberships to uh, people here. That's awful nice, thank you. A slip and score works like a perforated line in my pottery creates a weak line. Well, yeah, I can see that too. I can see where it'd be a weak spot. You know, I'm just saying if you can't if you can't get it bonded well, it's one way to maybe get it attached. Uh, I had that problem for a while, but I added slip and then bonded it. Well, thank you so much. Excited to start. Have you added cactus juice to your clay? Um, no, I have not added cactus juice to my clay. Tony Soares would be the guy to talk to about that. He has done experiments with adding cactus juice, and I think agave nectar to his clay. So um, he knows more about that than I do. So um, you might hit him up. He's here on YouTube. Just go to just go to the search bar and type for Tony Soares, S-O-A-R-E-S. -E <clears throat> uh, is there any other way to make organic paint besides mesquite beans or yucca fruit? Yeah, you can make organic paint out of almost anything. Uh, just take it, take the plant, put it in a pot, boil it for a couple hours so you have a strong tea, Strain out all the solids. Uh, so what you're after is the pot, you know, the pot liquor, the, the juice, the tea that's made from this plant. Uh, and then you just boil it down until it's a thick syrup. So, yeah, anything. I like the reason I like mesquite uh, beans and uh, yucca fruit is because they have a high sugar content. So that gives you more yield uh, up in like northern Arizona, New Mexico. They use Rocky Mountain bee plant and tansy mustard, which are also uh, good. But you get less yield because they're lower in sugars. Uh, yeah, you can make organic paint out of a lot of things. <clears throat> um, uh, good advice. Thank you. I've been starting my fire from the bottom, and that caused a lot of issues. Try cover shirts to start fire from the top. Uh, trying to paint with red ochre <clears throat> and manganese dioxide, mixing with different ratios of clay. It rubs off or leaves ghostly shapes, something dark streaks. Do you know common causes for this? If your clay isn't sticking to the pot, I mean, if you're, if your pigments aren't sticking to the pot, it's because you don't have enough of a fixative. The fixative is something that's going to make it harden in the fire. Uh, there's three kinds of fixatives, right? There's um, there's um, a chemical fixative like um, uh, like a glaze, right? That's going to make it kind of melt and stick to the pot. Um, there's there's clay fixatives that are just going to if you mix enough clay with any pigment, it's going to harden in the fire. But you you have to know at what temperature that clay you're mixing. Uh, you know, matures, turns to ceramic, right? Uh, I would suggest you use the same material as your body clay. That way, you know, when the clay is fired, uh, that that pigment clay is fired as well. Uh, or you can mechanically fix it, fix mechanical fix it. And that is taking a stone and polishing those lines of paint to set them down into that clay body. Um, and so if it's not, if you're using clay and it's not sticking, use more clay, right? So I use a third, uh, I use one third clay, and two thirds pigment. But if that wasn't working, I would up the amount of clay until it started sticking. So you just run, run some experiments, make yourself a test tile, paint on your regular recipe, increase the clay by whatever, a little bit, paint another line, increase the clay a little bit more, paint another line, right? And then fire it, then wipe it, wipe it real good. You can take it in a sink and scrub it even, and then see where it starts sticking. And that's the recipe you want to use. Um, I'm trying to paint. Oh, I read that one. Hey, Andy, you're awesome. Thanks, Whitehall Gaming. 
Hi, Andy. Almost missed this. YouTube said it was starting at one and didn't send me a reminder. Oh, sorry about that. It was 11 o'clock mountain time. Um, okay, let me uh, let me go back to the, where was I at? Uh, not bonding coils, slipping too much. Uh, not bonding coils, good. Yeah, I did that. Clay too wet, slipping. So the next one I'm going to talk about is slipping too much on bone dry pottery. So this is this is a common one. This is another one that I struggled with for a long time. Um, when you're slipping a bone dry pot, and you don't have to slip bone dry. I usually slip leather hard, but sometimes you do. And especially if you're trying to, well, like, like down in Mata Ortiz, they always slip bone dry because they use sandpaper. So you have to get bone dry so that you can sand it. And then you're slipping it bone dry. Um, so a lot of people do. And when you're slipping, well, even when you're slipping uh, leather hard, though, you if you add too much slip, that slip is full of water, right? It's 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 clay that's just mixed up with a lot of water, it's liquid clay. If you add that, when you're putting that on the pot, you're adding moisture to the pot. And that clay is absorbing that moisture. And when clay absorbs moisture, what does it do? It expands, right? That That's what clay does. It expands when it's wet. It contracts when it's dry. That's what causes those cracks in the bottom of mud puddles or dry lake beds. And so uh, when you're adding that much moisture to the clay body of a pot that's already built, it can expand really rapidly and it'll just fall apart or break, especially the insides of bowls. Somehow when you're putting it on the inside of a bowl, that expansion is outward. It'll just blow that bowl into pieces. Whereas the outside, the, it expands, this puts pressure inside. So it's a little more durable. Um, so too much slip on bone dry pottery, or even like I said, even leather hard. If you put too much, uh, that is a problem. How do you avoid it? Um, just one thin coat of slip, thin coat of slip, and then wait like a half hour. Let it, let that moisture dissipate. And then another thin coat, and then wait a half an hour. You, if you put, you know, just try putting it all on at once, you're going to have trouble. So, um, or do it leather hard. You're a little safer. And it depends a lot on the clay body. I found that some clay bodies really rehydrate quickly. They get that moisture and they just they just go to town and they just break themselves much more easily than others. Uh, so I have this picture of um, uh, Paul Thornburg. Paul Thornburg is a replicator who lives uh, here in my area down in Sonoida. And he um, he made, they made, he and his wife made really beautiful membrous uh, bowls for years, really gorgeous membrous bowls. And he actually would, is the greenware bowl and it was it wasn't fully dry okay it was maybe leather hard right he would get like a like a cup of of slip right he'd mix up a cup of his white slip and he would pour it into the bowl and then he'd you like rotate the bowl to make sure it's coated and then he'd pour it back into the container i tried that i tried that i must have, i don't know i want to say i tried it 20 times but I, I probably didn't try it 20 times you know you you get frustrated you do it the first time the bowl breaks it, to pieces in your hand. Two, three, four. I must have done it five or six times. I, I might have done it 10 times. Kept thinking, well, Paul Thornburg does it. Why won't it work for me? I, I don't know. You know, I asked him when I was at his house last year, I said, how do you do that? What is the secret? He said, I'm, you know, just do it real fast. <laughs> it doesn't work for me. So um, I think the clay body had something to do with it. He had a clay body that wasn't you know, absorb, or maybe it wasn't tempered as much as mine or something. So, so that it was that, that tempering adds porosity that allows that moisture to, it, it's there to let moisture escape, but it also can allow moisture to enter the clay body as well. At any rate, you know, different clay bodies absorb moisture at a different rate. Uh, and so you can slip dry, bone dry. You have to be careful because you can break a lot of pottery that way. And, you know, like I said, pouring it in and liquid, like just pouring it into a bowl, I wouldn't even go there. <laughs> I would not. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is not firing hot enough. This is super common with new people, um, you know, especially if they don't have a lot of experience with fire. Okay, so um, when I first started making replica pottery, um, I had already done a lot of camping, and so I I'd spent a lot of time around campfire. You know, when you're a little kid and you're playing with fire and you're putting sticks in it and stuff. Um, and, and that helps you just having an understanding of how to make a fire burn hotter and those kind of things. And, and that's just experience. That's just experience being around something. Um, and then I fought forest fires. I worked for the U.S. Forest Service for years and fought forest fires. And, and that was around the time I was just getting started in pottery as well. So that really gave me a really good understanding, not just 
not just the science behind pottery, you know, the fire triangle and, and that kind of thing, which is good, but just being around fire and knowing kind of how to get it to burn more vigorously. And I see a lot of people that are just getting into primitive pottery and they, they take it out and they kind of timidly make a fire and it, Oh, I fired my pottery, but then it turns out it wasn't fired hot enough because the, um, the clay didn't mature or, um, uh, it's all black and sooty because it didn't um, it didn't get hot enough to burn the carbon off of it, right? Did you bring me a drink? I did. It's getting warmer out here. I it was 50 some degrees freezing. this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that's a common thing, right? You, the pots are gray or they, they're not fully fired, right? Um, and so, and that's just because people are a little timid about fire or they don't, they don't realize, you know, you get a feel for things. You fired 10, 12, 20 times. You get a feeling for how much fire and how, you know, without even having a gun, like I measure it with an infrared gun, but not everybody has one, but you can just get a feel for it. You know, you just watch the fire and go, yeah, that got hot enough. Or, I don't think that got hot enough. And then you learn what to look for on the pot as well. Uh, you know, and I can see the pot based on that. The colors are cleaned up. Doesn't have a lot of carbon on it. Right. Rings, you know, there's different things you can look for. Um, but not getting fire hot enough, that's pretty common. There's a lot of people, especially when they first start out. Uh, I think if I was giving advice to somebody who was just getting started in primitive pottery, they wanted to do open outdoor firings, I'd say err on the side of too much fire than not enough. Build yourself a big old bonfire. It, it's better that you go over than that you go under. Because if you go under, you, you might not even have pottery. Let me go back to the uh, chat. We've got a bunch of them in here. <clears throat> and, then, uh, and then we'll talk about the giveaway. Because it's after 11.30. So let's see. I'm trying to figure out where I was. I don't know where I was. Help. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, you are totally getting me into pottery. Just made some clay from soil in my backyard. Nevada clay. It's very plastic. That's awesome. Glad to hear it. Uh, I found out that they're making Oya or terracotta refrigerators in India. And I've been trying to buy them. Can't find them now. I want to make them. Yeah, that'd be a great project. I'd love to learn more about it if you figure out like a a good place where I can learn about those. Send me a link. Uh, cover sherds work like a charm. When I started making polychrome, I did not use any pottery sherds and it made a lot of splotches. And when I added pottery sherds, the, the pattern was extremely clean. Yeah, that'll keep the keep the fuel off for clean polychrome for sure. Sorry about the autocorrect Oya refrigerator. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Uh, two plus two equals four. Got it. I made a coil and wrapped it around my finger, like you said, and it never came close to breaking. How do you tell if I need or how much temper I need. Um, I would add 20% just as a standard rule with a new clay and then and then go from there, right? Once you've made a pot and fired it, then you might go, you know what, I need more temper. Or you might go, you know what, um, I'm gonna try it with a little less. But I think 20 is a good place to start with any new clay, especially if it's that plastic out of the ground. It probably does need some temper. Uh, sorry about the, oh, I saw that. Why does my slip come off when I'm trying to burnish it? Um, I don't know. Is it possible you're burnishing when it's still too damp? So when you first, when I first apply my slip, um, you know, it, it's very delicate because it's wet. And then I'll let it dry a little bit. And then I take my stone and I just lightly go over the pot. And I look at the stone. Is it sticking? If the, if the, if the slip is sticking to my stone, it needs to dry more. Once I should be able to go over it at, at some point of dryness and it should start getting a glossy finish. That's when you're at the right stage of dryness for, for slip or for burnishing. Um, but if it's coming off after it's dry, then probably what you're slipping it with isn't actually clay or has too much impurities in it. But uh, it's possible you're, you're polishing too soon. Uh, there's Dave, old Lanite Dave. A lot of you YouTube videos show slipping bone dry pots. Maybe it depends on the clay, but that's always been disastrous for me. Yeah, yeah like me, I, you know, I've seen people do it. I try it, it doesn't work so good. So it's one of those things, you know, maybe it'll work for you, but it doesn't work for me. When you add slip, can you moisten the inside to make it stick? Um, like you're slipping bone dry? Um, I don't. No, I've never heard of that being done, but maybe. I don't have the most experience with slipping bone dry, so I'm probably not the person to ask that. Uh, when you add slip, can you moisten? Oh, I read that. Sorry. Okay, two plus two equals four. 20 bucks. Sorry if off topic. Oil refrigerator I've seen in India to help those in poverty 
refrigerate their food a little bit better. Have you seen this in the future? Could you? Yeah, I'd love to do a video about it. Uh, I just don't know enough about it. So um, like I said, I appreciate the 20 bucks, by the way, two plus two equals four. If you know of a link where there's good information on it, uh, shoot it to me because I'd like to learn more and it would make a great video. Um, you know, if it works in India, it'd work great in Arizona for sure. I've always slipped when it was leather hard. Didn't even think of getting a pot, dry pot when making it wet again. Or use a plant misting spray bottle. Yeah, that didn't get hot enough. It was too damp inside. Well, that's a lot, a lot of stinking comments here, people. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to work through these. Oh, what time we got? 11.35. Ah, I'm trying to also getting a pot fire to the short amount of time you do, especially with the very large pots that don't fit in my kill. My father barbecued also. Sounds similar to water jugs. I love the thermal gun. Did not fire fully the first time. I think you can cover sure 20% temper by volume, weight or volume. 20% temper by weight or volume. I measure my temper by volume. So I dry, I grind my clay dry. I grind my temper dry. And then I just use a scoop of any size. And I do, um, you know, four scoops of clay, one scoop of sand. Four scoops of clay, one scoop of sand. So by volume, because it's real easy to measure it out that way. It's not rocket science. It just isn't. I think you can. Uh, thank you for the advice. All right. Moving right along. Let's talk about the kit. All right. Um, the, the, I'm going to give away this kit today. You have to have, remember, you have to have, this is a pottery kit. It's a full pottery kit. Includes includes clay as well as uh, white clay for, it includes a reddish brown clay for building and white clay for decorating. So everything you need to make a pot. Um, remember that um, you need to have a U.S. mailing address to be eligible because I can't mail it to another country. Okay. Um, give me a second to set this up and I'm going to let you start. Okay. So the, uh, the, the, the hashtag you want to type into the um, chat is ancient pottery kit. And I'll put it on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about. One word, ancient pottery kit. Okay. One word. If you do not with the hashtag in front, if you do not do it in one word like that, you're not going to get selected because it's, the application is selecting for that uh, that phrase exactly. Uh, okay, and then I will draw uh, in a few minutes here. Okay, I'm gonna let it. I'm gonna let it run through the the chat. That way, everybody gets a chance. A adding adding it more than once will not help you. Only enter it one time. That's all you need. Okay. When I started researching and found your channel, it's been incredibly helpful, and I've had a lot of success following your information. Glad to hear that, OB Arts. Love these live videos, super useful information, and you answered our questions. A blessing, learning a lot, not me. Glad, glad to hear it. And thank you, not me, for the 99 cent super sticker. I appreciate you. Okay, getting a whole bunch of these in here. Um, and I'm going to go on while you guys are doing that, and I'm going to uh, finish uh, going through these. 10 mistakes that people make. Uh, not firing hot enough was the last one we did. Uh, drawing unevenly or too quickly is another one. So um, people, <clears throat> when as I mentioned before, clay is expansive. It expands when it's damp. It contracts when it's dry. Uh, and that can cause a lot of problems, especially towards getting your pot to the firing and, and through it. When you make a pot, that clay has to be wet. It has to be plastic. <clears throat> before you fire, it has to be completely dry. And so we're, we're looking to shrink that pot down. All clays have different shrinkage rates. Some clays have ridiculously high shrinkage rates. It's almost impossible to make a pot out of bentonite clay because even if you could work with it, uh, it shrinks so much that it would, it would break the pot. Uh, and so even with your, the best clay you can buy, you know, from a commercial supplier, it's going to have a shrinkage rate that you have to deal with. So drawing your pot unevenly, setting your pot rim side up, you know, letting it dry with the rim side up out in the sun. It's going to dry incorrectly. It's going to dry unevenly. The, the top will dry fast. The rim has more surface area. You'll get a breeze over here. You might get some sunshine over here. Start drying up here more. Uh, and it's going to crack because you're trying to make that whole pot shrink down together. Otherwise, if it dries more here or more here, then, you know, it just breaks. So uh, you've, you've got to make sure it dries evenly. And that's really one of the biggest tasks that uh, the potter has to accomplish. So a lot of times I will dry my pots upside down 
That way the rim is not catching all that air. Uh, and then still be careful, you know, because you're, it's sitting upside down, but maybe there's, you know, there's a breeze from this side or something. So you have to, you have to rotate it, look at it. And sometimes you might find that sitting upside down for a day, the bottom is pretty dry, but the rim is, is getting too damp. So you have to actually flip it over and let it dry like this for a while. A lot of times if I'm drying it like this, I'll put just a, like a handkerchief or something over it just to keep the breeze off of it a little bit so it doesn't dry too much. Of course, I live in Tucson where things dry very fast because the weather's usually, the air is usually very dry. That's not the same for everybody. So um, be aware. Um, I have another example of something drying too. No, I don't have any pots yet. I've broken that way. But when I was first starting, I broke a lot of pots that way. And I, and I, I happens in my workshop every year. Somebody, somebody breaks a pot because they left it sitting, you know, upright on the table or something. I'm always reminding my students, turn your pots upside down, let them dry upside down, be careful, you know, so uh, uneven drying or too quick drying. Like I said, like sometimes you get frustrated and you're like, man, I want to get to the point where I can slip this or where I can polish it and it's not drying fast enough. So they go stick it in the sun. Boom. You know, it breaks it, it, you can't stick it in the sun. Now, again, a lot of that depends on your clay. Some people have really great clay that can handle that. So uh, Chad Zuber, I did some, uh, a couple of videos with Chad last year. He's a YouTuber. You can look him up here. He does survival videos. And, um, he did a, he had a video on, I think Instagram yesterday where he had a pot and he was warming it by the fire to dry it. And I said, you got good clay, Chad. And I know he has good clay. Um, because a lot of clays wouldn't handle that. They'd, they'd break if you tried to dry them in front of a fire, just because they they're drying too fast. Uh, a lot of it depends on your clay. Okay. Where are we at here? Oh, I did that one already. I'll try the next one. Not adding enough temper to your clay. Boom. That's a that's a big one. So you um the temper, a uh, temper is protecting your pot uh, a couple of ways. Uh, it's reducing the shrinkage rate. So the temper makes the pot shrink less, which as I said is a cause of breakage. Um but it also protects it from thermal shock in the firing. So when it's firing, uh, it, the temper prevents it from cracking so easily. And so those are two different places where you can break your pot if you don't have enough temper in it. And so, um, like I said, when you first, when you first find a new clay, you might experiment with it, figure out what amount of temper to put in it. But a lot of times, if you're just starting out, you might not know, you know, um, and, and it also depends on your firing method, right? So I'll tell you a story about Clint Swink. I've probably told this story before. Clint Swink, he's a famous replicator lives up in, you know, near Durango, Colorado. He makes Mesa Verde black and white pottery. Really fine, fine work. And um, he was coming to the kiln conference and he fires in a hole in the ground. He fires in a trench kiln. So it's a it's a slab lined hole and then the fire is built over it. So pots are down here, fires up here. There's cover shirts between the pot and the fire. So they don't get a lot of, the temperature rises pretty slowly in that kiln because of that. Um, my firings are very different. They're on the surface fire is built over the pot and I start the fire from the bottom and it goes up quick. Right. Um, so Clint was coming to the kiln conference. This was 2016, I think. And he was making a bunch of pots and he's a bunch of polychrome pots, which he doesn't usually make. He makes black on white Mesa Verde style pottery. Uh, so he said, Andy, I'm going to let you fire my pots because I trust you. And, um, you know, you know what you're doing when it comes to these polychrome firings. So I made a big firing with, my some of my pottery, some of Clint's, and some of I think a couple other people's stuff was in there. And um, I did it the way I usually do it. And I broke, I think, three or four of Clint's pots, really beautiful pots that I broke. And the reason was he's using like 10 or 12 percent temper, and I'm using like 20 percent temper. And the reason he ha he's getting away with less temper is because he's firing down in that hole, the temperature rises very slowly, and I'm firing on the surface without cover shirts. Man, that radiant heat from the fire, man, it'll just run those temperatures up quick and break stuff that's not tempered enough. So not adding enough temper can really get you. Uh, so that's a, that's a common mistake. I mean, like I said, even if you're experienced because say you fire it a different way, all of a sudden all bets are off. Not preheating thoroughly, man. I, I do it all the time. And here's, here's my most recent. Well, I might have done one even more recent than this. Big bowls are really hard to preheat because, and they're laying on the ground. They they want to kind of lay like this. You prop them on a rock, but you're still kind of 
still kind of flat. So the bottom, the bottom inside and outside, really hard to get a good preheat on that. So a lot of times with a big bowl like this, it's smart to put it in your oven even before you go out. If you're going to fire in an open firing, in your oven is a safe place because that bottom is hard. You almost have to get it like propped up on a big rock or a log so that it's standing upright so that you can warm that bottom effectively because there's going to be moisture in it. Even no matter how long you made that pot ago, there's still going to be some moisture in that clay. And that's what happened here. So I made this big, beautiful St. John polychrome bowl. And I didn't preheat it thoroughly. It's all on video. You can watch it where I didn't I didn't preheat it. And um, I mean, I did preheat it, but it was it was laying down like this. So the bottom didn't get properly heated. And um, it went off like a bomb. Boom. You know, because there was moisture in there. And that's what will happen with moisture is it, it tries to escape once it reaches the state where it's trying to turn into water vapor and it can't get out of that clay. It'll just blow the clay up to get out. Um, and so this was actually two different problems. This one was. Um, the problem of not being preheated enough and it got too hot. So the wind picked up right after I started and uh, um, these little bits of clay, it's hard to see in here, but the little, the, the clay where it was broken, it's all kind of warped and stuff now because the firing was so hot that it kind of curled it. And so uh, it's a really interesting piece, but it's literally some of these little pieces of broken pot are curled up and that's because it was so hot. So it got too hot and it wasn't preheated correctly. But um, common common problem if you don't preheat it and you can get explosions and broken pots. And so um, it's it's a real problem. Uh, the last one I did, I did a, a test, I did a demonstration pottery firing out at Steam Pump Ranch in Oro Valley, Arizona here, December. And um, I had these cover shirts, these mic micaceous clay cover shirts that I was firing. And I had them all sitting around the fire preheating well because it was kind of in a pit i could kind of stand them up but there were so many other people who showed up at the firing to get their pottery fired that was running out of room and so i i took some of the cover shirts out to make room for other people's pots and they hadn't heated enough before i took them out and so one of those cover shirts just boom went off like a bomb in that fire and that i knew exactly what the problem was just real common 44 oh my gosh uh hopefully these are all I'm looking at the tech, the chat now. <laughs> Hopefully these are all uh, that um, that uh, ancient pottery kit. Yeah, it only helps you to add it once. You will not help you to add it twice. And uh, capitalization doesn't matter. Uh -huh. I don't usually have problems with drying because I live in a coastal area and there's a lot of humidity. Yeah, well, the other problem with that is drying so slow, having difficulty getting your pots dry because you're in a, a, a damp area. Wheel potter here. Sometimes I use a piece of saran wrap on my handles and rims. Yeah, yeah, I do that sometimes. Uh, so if you have a different, a different shape pot like this, and you've got, you've got feet and you've got horns and you've got a tail and you know you got all these kind of appendages, saran wrap's really good to kind of cover up certain things and make sure that it doesn't dry unevenly. Same with like this double pot, right? I've got, I've got two rims. I've got this handle. You know, and I was scared to death I was going to let it dry too quickly and, and it was going to crack. So I used a lot of saran wrap on that. Uh, I'd pay for his classes if I could. His pookie course is totally, is free, totally worth it. Thank you, not me. Three entries, highly recommend your workshops. Hi, glad I got to the stream. Drawing is an issue here sometimes. I live in a boat. Oh, <laughs> I imagine that would be. He said it only works once. Wasn't sure. Yeah, you only have to add it in once. You only have to add the um. If you if you're looking for the um, if you've come recently and you're looking for the giveaway, I'm gonna be doing that in just a minute. You have to have a U.S. mailing address and you have to enter hashtag Ancient Pottery Kit. Um, and capitalization doesn't matter. And you only you only have to add it once. I'm still working through the um, uh, the chat to make sure I've answered all the questions. So uh, be patient. Even my pinch pots fall off the bottom when they sit on their bottoms while preheating around the fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. And, and I didn't mention that because um, uh, it's not so much a problem here where I live because usually the ground is pretty dry here in Tucson. But other parts of the country uh, where the ground will have moisture in it, you take that dry pot and you set it on the ground next to the fire to preheat. It will wick up moisture out of the ground and you'll get a blowout on the bottom. So um, a lot of times what they do, you'll see this at the kiln conference a lot uh, because that's usually farther north. And they'll take little pieces of broken sherds with them, cover sherds, and the, every pot gets sit on a cover sherd 
or on a rock or something so that you're not wicking up moisture out of the ground. That is something to be aware of for sure. I love the broken bowl. Sometimes whoopsies create their own beauty. Uh, in a previous chat, a viewer suggested to take the wet clay and shape it into a pizza shape, cut in quarters. Yeah, that's one way to figure out the, you know, 20% or 25% temper, depending on what you're wanting. So you can basically just cut out a wedge and then fill it with sand. And then that'll kind of give you an idea of what, what that is. Clint's Nass name again. Oh, Clint Swink, S-W-I-N-K. He has an excellent book, um, Messages from the High Desert, which you can buy on Amazon. And um, he goes through the whole process of how to make um, that Mesa Verde trench kiln fired black on white pottery. It's a $50 book, but I'm telling you, it's totally worth it. Uh, do you find that more that a more coarse angular sand works better than fine? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the temper that works best is temper that has sharp edges because it can grip the clay. So, um, volcanic ash, um, what's the other thing that, um, uh, diatomaceous earth are both super fine and they have sharp edges. One, because it was blown up in a, you know, in, in a volcano and the other, because it's, it's little um, fossils. Um, so uh, those sharp edges are great because it'll grab the clay. Um, beach sand, river sand, wash sand, these are rounded because, you know, they've been tumbled by the water for centuries. And so what I do sometimes if I grab sand out of a wash is I'll run it through my corn grinder just once, and that'll just kind of break it up and sharpen it, uh, which will help make it better. Uh, and the same with grog, right? Grog is ground up ceramics. Again, it'll have sharp edges because it's recently ground. Uh, not preheating thoroughly. Where am I at here? I don't have temper. Oh, yeah. So the last, I have one more. I only have one more. What are we at time-wise? Uh, 11.51. We're doing good on time. Uh, so the last one is not preheating thoroughly. So, oh, that's what I talked about here. That's related to, um, did I already do that? Maybe I already talked about not preheating thoroughly. Oh, well. Um, yeah. So that was my that was my number one. Sorry. I guess I did them all. That's all 10. So we can go ahead and let me see. I've never done one of these, uh, one of these giveaways before. So let me, let me see. Oh, the kiln conference this year. Um, the kiln conference this year is going to be at um, uh, Crow Canyon. It's an archaeological center in or near Cortez, Colorado. And I do not have a date, but I was told a tentative date. Uh, tell you what, I don't remember what he told me. He told me a tentative date. It's not for sure yet. And they won't know for sure until I think April. But I will put the tentative date in the doobly-doo after the live stream. So if you come back, you can see what it is. Because I don't remember. I'd tell you what it is, but I don't remember. Um, okay, I'm going to try to do this um, this giveaway. I've never done it before, so you got to uh, you got to bear with me. Um, share screen. I'm working on it. Oh no, Google Chrome cannot be able to record the content of your screen until it is quit. Um, sorry guys, I can do the giveaway, but um, I can't show you the, the, the cool StreamYard giveaway tool, which is why I'm using StreamYard. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I can't, sh I sh I it's a browser setting and my, my operating system won't let me uh, show it to you. Okay, I've got 48, I'll tell you this though. There are 48 entries. And that's going to draw um, completely random one of these entries to win the kit. And it is going to be Clara Allen 12. Clara Allen 12, are you here? Drop something in the chat if you're here, Clara Allen 12. I didn't see you in here earlier, but that doesn't mean anything. I'm sure you're in here. Uh, so... Clara Allen 12, can you say something to let me know you're here and have a U.S. address? Otherwise, I'm going to do it again. No, I guess Clara's not here. We got to stick around. Okay, I'm going to draw again, guys. She is here indeed, says Granny Goose. Well, I'm waiting to hear from her. In the meantime, I was going to show you this. Um, this is a this is a, a good example of over fire. It got too hot. You see the? I've probably showed this before. You see the the horn here? You see the way it's kind of cracked? 
it got too hot. That's a good example of overfiring. And then I have another example here that I didn't talk about, and it is underfiring. So uh, this is another thing that happens a lot. Uh, like a red or a brown clay will will have a lower maturation temperature because it's full of uh, iron and other fluxes that give it a, a allow it to harden earlier. Uh, but white clays will have higher temperatures because they don't have all those minerals in them. So what happens is the clay itself hardens, but the white slip, you see where it's coming off? That's just washing it. So get it home from firing it, take it and wash it. And all the slip starts coming off along here and up, up here, see? And that's under fired. So that's, it's a good pot. The pot is sound, but the slip isn't. So that's another example. I am going to draw again because I haven't heard anything from um, old Clara Allen. So uh, sorry about that, Clara. You got to stick around if you want the giveaway. We're picking again. And this time it looks like gopher. Do we have gopher here? Gopher. G-O-P-H-E-R. Gopher. She's here, says Glass. Somebody, please, I'm Cla <laughs> Clara Allen, 12? What are you doing? <laughs> Wait, please, I'm Clara Allen, 12. <laughs> I'm in Colorado. Well, where, where, where were you? <laughs> Gophers here. Clara checked in commented all right all right i'll give it to go i'll give it to clara allen but i i, I don't know i kept saying you i was waiting for you i didn't hear nothing oh i see you did check in i just totally missed it didn't she she commented said judith winner <laughs> i'm sorry guys there's so many comments in here today i don't know how many people are in the chat today but um yeah there's a lag you're right about that there's a lag she did it before you call gopher yeah okay 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 clara it's all good I'm, i'll send it to you um but send me, uh, Clara, would you send me an email um, with your uh, with your address? My email is andy at ilabmedia.com, or you can um, you can go to my website. Uh, where's my website? I got my thing here. <clears throat> go to my website, ancientpottery.how, and just go to the contact form. You can send me an email, and that way we can um, we can correspond, and I can get your address and and get that mailed out uh, next week. Okay. I I'm sorry about the difficulty. I don't know why I didn't see you checking in. And I'm sorry about that gopher too. Uh, I'll send you something too, gopher. If you send me a um, if you send me a, an email as well, gopher, I'll send you something. It's not the kit, but I'll send you something to make up for it. Okay. Um, okay. Are we got any other questions here? Did we get it all covered? All right then, everybody. Y'all have a great weekend, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks for coming.